So I'm, I'm pleased to introduce our uh, speaker today. Um, Sara Hamaday is um, an assistant professor and she did her undergraduate work at a um, regional university in Iran and then she did her masters at a university that was founded a hundred years before Stony Brook, um, mid uh, 1800s, the University of Tehran. Then she moved to the United States, did her PhD at Texas A&M, and then she went on to Iowa State, where um, her first disaster studies were related to um, weather conditions out there, which bring tornadoes, and how they affected rural communities. And today she's going to uh, talk to us about, let me go back to the screen, All right, multi-hazard, multi-case housing recovery modeling. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, thank you. I hope everybody on Zoom can hear me. I think everybody here can hear me. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today has to do with presenting quite a few housing recovery models, trying not to get overwhelmed. Don't worry too much about the details. I will summarize the details later for you. There are some big picture items that I will make sure I highlight clearly enough. The big, big, big picture stuff are the major points that I want to cover today. And the reason I say that is I want this to be truly about the idea of uh, what we can learn from comparing outcomes of various models, various case studies, various types of hazards, and various ways of measuring something, that something being a, a post-disaster housing recovery. That's something that I think about a lot. First, I should tell you why housing recovery. Of course, I don't have to justify why you study disasters. You all know, it's very important to study disasters. And just in the past nine months, we have three more months to go for just this year. Um, the first nine months of 2021, we have had 18 uh, federal declared disasters, each one of them individually costing us as a nation more than one billion dollars. 18 of those. And the year is not over yet, unfortunately. And this is not the worst year even in the past few years. Uh, in that context, why am I so interested in housing, housing, housing? Why uh, most of my papers have to do with housing? There are a few reasons. Um, I don't have time to talk about all of them, but mainly, economically speaking, for an individual household, for a community also, for a city, for a whole economy, house, housing is a major investment, is a major part of the spending that we do on infrastructure, um, um, and it has, it's, it's a major economic sector for us. When you think about households individually, uh, housing is usually the, the biggest financial investments they make. So housing recovery has really, really damaged and recovery has really high stakes. Also really importantly, the fact that housing recovery is not just about housing. Housing recovery is about the psychological, emotional, cultural, social, economical, you name it, health, I shouldn't forget that, um, impacts and recovery of a household and a community. So when I talk about housing, I'm not just talking about the building, what happens to the building after a disaster. I'm talking about all of those interdependencies, engineers like to call them, I'm just stealing it from them, um, that rely on that phenomenon of housing recovery. So what I am trying to achieve here, and I will say before I go to Iowa, uh, when I started my work in Texas, um, uh, this idea has been forming, it was never as clear to me, I'm sure can always gain in clarity, but at that point when I started in 2011 studying housing recovery, um, it was much more scattered. I didn't have this view that I have today, which I hope will improve through the next few years, um, that what is housing recovery? And I'm asking this as a, maybe call it an epistemological question. What I have learned, which I think must really inform how we measure, model, quantify housing recovery, is a, a few uh, characteristics in the US, I must emphasize. 
housing recovery is very different when you go to Europe, when you go to developing countries like Iran, so on and so forth. In the US, the most important thing, if you forget everything, just remember this. Unfortunately, housing recovery in this country is extremely market driven. What do I mean by that? You live in a pretty capitalistic system, right? So the assumption, the big assumption behind all of our housing recovery assistance, uh, governance policies, regulations, you name it, has to do with the fact that we assume, the government and non-government assume that the private market, in other words, private construction industry, contractors, and insurance companies will take care of housing recovery when disasters happen, no matter how small or big they are. Because of this, we have decades and decades of data that shows housing recovery is a slow, much longer term than what we were assuming a couple of decades ago in our disaster papers. It's extremely unequal. We cannot afford to measure it at aggregate level. And it's extremely complex. I already talked about that a little bit in the previous slide. Um, it's connected to many other aspects of household and community recovery. So if this is my understanding, my theoretical conceptualization of housing recovery, what does that mean for the way I think about modeling and quantifying it? And let me just say in parenthesis, why do we care about good modeling? Without good modeling, without good quantification, we are not going to have any chance of informing sound policy that would actually have any chance of reducing all the suffering and losses that we will go through um, housing recovery, which many, many community leaders very often call, this is our second disaster. First disaster was much easier. What Mother Nature sent us was much easier than the second disaster. So I'm saying we need to have complex ways of measuring it. I'm saying we have to bring in various disciplinary perspectives from um, 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 quantif quantitative modeling to uh, social science perspectives, to engineering, physical stuff, so on and so forth. Link those approaches to understand housing in measurements and modeling. And in terms of the causal factors that we bring into our modeling, we need to be open-minded and inclusive. What do we take into, what causal factors do we bring in when we try to find what is actually driving, uh, determining uh, housing recovery? So just a few, I emphasize, just a few suggestions in terms of measurement based on various definitions. The list can go uh, way, way, way longer than this. Uh, for many, many years, the official, um, I mean, uh, organizations like FEMA produced this, uh, uh, this graphic. All they cared about was the aggregate number of housing units that were being rebuilt. Now we know, statistically, there are tons and tons of disparities that can be quantifiable. Um, housing recovery could be about completion of repairs or reconstruction. It could be about whether or not the family occupies their pre-disaster home, which is very different from this one and has different causal factors. Or it could be based on value, and what happens to the value I mean, from an economic perspective. So what I am going to do in the next, I don't know how many minutes that I have, is to build upon that background that I just uh, presented to you and um, show you three examples. Again, don't worry about these details. I will walk you through them. Three various approaches to measure housing recovery, this phenomenon that I'm very interested in. Um, to measure it and to model it. By modeling, I'm talking about causal factors, what drives it, um, what uh, determines the outcomes. I will compare the common causal factors across this, but the most important thing maybe to take away from this presentation is the is the diversity of possibilities of ways to measure something. That is a social, economic, physical, you name it, phenomenon um, that is very complex. So this is just the past two or three years of my efforts uh, to uh, try to think through this. Now, I should say, before going into any of those details, the reason that I have had the luxury of thinking about this and uh, doing all of the data collection modeling is because of my involvement with this $40 million center funded by NIST, um, which was started by engineers, but they were very friendly engineers. So now we have an economist co-director, uh, lady, uh, Dr. Ellen Wood, uh, 
retired. Here we go. So now we have an engineer co director, John, and an economist co director. And you can see this is just a short list of the universities. We have more than 100 PhD students, postdocs, uh, PIs in the center. Oh, it's great. So, first things first, the framework, very briefly, that we have been able to use in the center of excellence. I mean, there are more than 100 researchers. Each one of them are focused, each group of them are focused on modeling something. Some of them are debris folks, some of them are utility folks, some of them are housing folks like me. This is just to show you the sources of support for doing this. We have multiple test beds, thanks to the Funding Fund Center. We have one really good field study, Lombardo, North Carolina, after Hurricane Ike. Uh, we just finished the wave four of data collection because of COVID, it had to be done uh, virtually. No, sorry, not virtually. We are made. We didn't get as many good responses as you would expect. But we're continuing the field study. Uh, next April or so, or so, we will do the fifth wave. We are going back to that city to track what's happening. Um, and of course, for me, all of this started with the fact that during my PhD a um, few years ago, I was able to start with empirical studies. So before this moves again, first group of models. The main thing that you would want to think about about this first group of models are these three items. I will show you the details, but I have to go through them a little bit faster because we don't have time. The first group of models, in terms of the structure of the model, it's statistical, empirical models that take a longitudinal perspective. Eight years of data, Galveston, Texas, it's a beautiful island. It's under extreme gentrification and Airbnb stress right now for the past few years. Uh, but uh, taking a panel perspective, to look at eight years of data, pre-Hurricane Ike in 2008, all the way up to 2015, measuring the outcomes as recovery of housing, restoration of housing. Through what proxy? Parcel value. Improvement parcel value from tax appraisal data, which took forever to clean, but it's done. Now, what we have here is three sets of models based on the features of the housing submarkets. Why do I call them different housing submarkets? This is a separate submarket, old housing, mostly permanent residents, mostly lower income, very, very historical. If you have heard about the June 5th celebration, it started here in Galveston Island. It has a big history of uh, black culture in the state of Texas. We have high-end, up to cold, new vacation housing here, low-end, all white, and not so welcoming, dilapidating, vacation housing here, all over Peninsula, okay? So three submarkets. And we have, uh, I, I have developed three sets of models for this. I'm not going to bore you with any of the coefficients and the, the models are extremely big. Here's just one graphic to show you descriptively the trajectories that we have. The outcome variable, like I said, was the logged um, improvement value of the house over these, um, over these years. The, uh, factors that we looked at, you can see one example of that here, damage level, damage level, Galveston Island vacation area, urban core, so these are two separate models. Factors we looked at that came out to be significant, their direction of significance in terms of causal impact, and the magnitude was different based on the sub market we were looking at. Damage level, tenure, renter, renter or um, owner, minority population in each neighborhood and income level. So this is the panel longitudinal model where I was measuring housing recovery as trajectory of value. Then a couple of years later, um, we came up with, I think, a nicer idea. But let's measure housing recovery not as value trajectory, but as chance of success, if you will. Chance of success in what? chance of success in going back to what you had. It's not ideal, but it's one way to measure and think about recovery. So here, in, in this set of models, housing recovery became about, uh, became restoration of three disaster values. And descriptively, you can see, descriptively, you can see the, 
the lines for restoration from two years all the way to up to uh, seven years. You can see a list of the causal factors that are used here. Individual housing tenure status, um, the number of years, like I said, seven years post disaster. Damage levels is also very, uh, always very important to include. And the neighborhood characteristics of uh, the location of the house, right? And again, we have 24,000 housing units in this. So our scores, the significance, would make any modeler, at least in social sciences, very happy. Don't worry about the coefficients here. I have a summary post-estimation graph uh, that at least captures the combination of tenure status with, with, the, uh, with the damage level. You can see, especially when it gets to later years, Galveston had a big, uh, what do you call it, lag. The resources came so late. More than 50% of the homeowners in Galveston did not have flood insurance. And as you know, when you have a hurricane, depending on whether the wind damage was larger or the flood damage was larger. In this case, flooding was larger. If you don't have flood insurance and FIP, who is going to pay for you? You have to wait and wait and wait for CDBGDR or other um, government resources grants to become available. You can see the big gap, uh, depending on the combination of damage and um, um, tenure status, um, in terms of uh, reaching the outcome of what are my odds of, what is this house's odds of, or chances of restoring its pre disaster value. Now, second group of models, totally different way of thinking about and measuring the outcome, which is housing recovery. The big phenomenon has not changed, it's still housing recovery. So, here, again, longitudinal, like I said, Lumberton, I consider myself extremely lucky since 2016 have been able to go every year, with the exception of the COVID year. Here we are doing longitudinal modeling of reaching different states, states that we were there to observe and ask and confirm with the households. The two states, I mean, the factor is time, of course, um, is the house repaired, how long did it take for it to finish repair? Is the house you occupied, how long did it take until you were able to reoccupy it? These are the input variables, and again, we did this survey with 568 households. Don't get too excited, not all of them responded. I mean, across the weights, we have 100-ish, 120 that consistently respond to all of the factors that we want for my modeling work. And the sad uh, truth about a lumber churn, if, if you want to look it up later, it's one of those older, low-income, predominantly low-income, very segregated the small towns in North Carolina, 22,000 or so were consistently from our sample, at least a third of them became vacant by Hurricane Matthew and people would never return. They couldn't do the repairs. So my outcome that I'm going to show you causal models for are these two. And you can see the descriptions of each of them. The main addition in this model that we, were, that we are not able to do with the first group of models which I just showed you when we use secondary data, yes, the number of observations were really big, 24,000. But we didn't have information on each individual household's application and receiving assistance. Here we could do that. We're sending our team of 30 people, we would stay in Lumberton for 10 days or so, and we would ask these questions. Did you apply for FEMA? Did you get it? Uh, when did you get it? How long did it take for you to get it? Uh, was it enough for your repairs? And that's the, fact, that's the case for all of these assistance sources. I'm not going to bore you with these details. I already told you about the field of study. There's a lot more to say. Just quickly, before I show the models, you can see the patterns, descriptive disparities in the timing of getting FEMA assistance, IHP, individual household program. That, that average is usually $5,000, by no means enough to doing flood repairs. Maximum allowed is $30,000, almost never happens. SBA loans, there are loans. You have to have good credit score. Um, you have to show that you can return it even though it's low interest. And then you have the NGO financial assistance. You can see some disparities descriptively uh, based on education level for access, or timing of access. Same thing based on household race. You can see some of the disparities in access, the timing of access to these three types of resources. Um, um, 
based on race and ethnicity. One other thing I should add is, I don't know of any other study before this where researchers and modelers could actually use household level um, separate type of assistance uh, uh, data collection and use it for modeling, which uh, I mean, we were the first ones to do it. And it's really important because in this case, it's not like the Gaveston models where you were saying, oh, if you are black, if you are better, uh, if you are this, if you are that, your chances of getting uh, back to your home is lower. Here, you can assign that outcome to something that you can actually change. I can't change anybody's race or accent or whatever, but I can change our assistance policy, right? I mean, I can try to change it. Uh, first model, the cover is state one. Days before repairs completed. I'm not going to go through the details because I will repeat them for you. Just highlighting one of them. See the major delay factor that is statistically significant that is caused by level of damage. The main thing it, sa it says to me is reduce damages, especially when it overlaps with socially vulnerable, lower income, lower resource households, the use damages, you don't have to worry so much about all of these pains, long-term pains in recovery. You know why we don't spend more money on that. Second model, days before your occupancy happened. And uh, please uh, note the difference between the occupancy as a way to measure recovery versus repairs. Many people move back to their houses when repairs are not finished. I have been to many houses in Lumberton where the smell of mold would just kill you, but they live there. They have no other choice. At the same, I mean, the other way around also is, is true. Many people do not move back to their home, even if it's totally habitable, no big damages, because something is wrong with the backyard or things like that. So income level has big implications for that. Major thing, again, 173 days of delay factor based on, um, based on damage level for occupancy. And you can see that income, personal resources, is also coming up as a significant factor. Now, third group of models. Again, shifting gears completely, a totally different way of measuring and modeling housing recovery. This is a simulation. This is a predictive way of modeling. Here, I work with one of my favorite civil engineers uh, to build a Markov chain model that predicts not housing recovery, but notice work. The housing recovery of households. Usually, I mean, I don't know, years ago, um, I had this very smart uh, architecture um, colleague. Um, he would always ask this question of, oh, you're showing me housing recovery models. Why should I care about what happens to this building? You should attach the pre-disaster household to that building, right? Then tell me what happened. So here's what you're trying to do here. The outcome you're trying to predict is the probability of you as a household attached to a housing unit, the probability of you transitioning to four stages, which I will show in a second. See the, ha the input, and then we use a uh, simulated uh, testbed community, which was developed by uh, Bruce Ellingwood, who was one of the co-directors of the center. We used the earthquake hazard that he had simulated for that, for application. The main idea here, in a nutshell, is that one of the biggest figures in disaster sociology, Quarantelli, Enrique Quarantelli, who was with, used to be with the uh, University of Delaware uh, Disaster Research Center, in 1990s, early 1990s, he had put forth this very, very popular idea that after a disaster, most households go through a linear step-by-step -step process of going from their damaged home to emergency shelter. Think of emergency shelter as the Red Cross shelters that are, get set up very quickly. And go to temporary shelter. Think of this as hotel vouchers that people get if they can't afford the hotel room themselves either uh, from government agencies or their insurance agent gives them one. Go to temporary housing. The, the most obvious example of this would be the ugly FEMA trailers, right? Um, after Katrina, people were living in this for 18 months plus. 
many of them had lead poisoning. And of course, the ultimate goal, permanent housing, which is either back to your own pre-disaster housing unit or a new permanent housing unit, which is now habitable for you. What we said with my engineering colleague was that, look, people do not go through this in a linear way. We have seen from so much anecdotal evidence and data that people jump through, people regress many of the time. There was only one dissertation in, I think, 2004, um, uh, which I found who had tried to question this and had like collected some data to show that it's, it doesn't work like that. Unfortunately, she had not published any papers of this, so we said, here's an opportunity for us. We can think about this issue and we can develop a better model. So the better model that we tried to develop was to consider quite a few possibilities, as you can see. It can be overwhelming. It was very overwhelming when you were trying to put this into math. But considering that you could jump and skip over all the steps, if you can afford it, of course, if you have the capacity and everything, and that there are four possible scenarios here. Of course, this is the ideal. This is what the US government assumes everybody does. Remember the market-driven assumption? It's very problematic. Only a percentage of our population can afford this. So we wanted to model the chances of a household going through each of these possible sequences. And another possible sequence, which we added to Quarantilla's model, is this one. You could say, many people say, People who go through, think of Lake Charles, Louisiana. Last year, they went through five, one after another, federally declared disasters. Their mayor on Facebook, or uh, I can't remember where, he was begging for assistance from somebody. So failure could happen to, people could become homeless to moving through these stages. I'm not going to talk about this equation. We have a better representation of this here. That Markov chain model, operationalized through this guy, which in Markov chain we call transition probability matrix. And this is what it does. This transition probability matrix predicts, let's say P2 and 1. This is the probability of, in time 0, being in a stage 2 temporary shelter, right, and going back to stage 1 emergency shelter when at time t. So this is the input to the model. We have some conditions, as you can see, for sending, for sending a person, a household, to stage five, which is, which is failure. If they repeat a certain step for this many times, so on and so on. So to show you what else we added to this uh, mark of chain modeling, we wanted to condition the probability of transition from step X to step Y on one other important thing, which was never done in the literature, and that was social vulnerability. So we built, quantified, a composite social vulnerability matrix. Unfortunately, for mathematical reasons, we couldn't do housing tenure, income level, race, ethnicity, education level, so on and so forth. So instead of that, we calculated a composite measure, and we said as social vulnerability changes from left to the right, how does your transition probability of going, let's say this is, look at this blue one, going from two to four. Temporary shelter, going all the way, jumping to your permanent housing. As social vulnerability increases, and probability decreases. How did we assign the social vulnerability scores of course, we have to start with our application um, case community, which, like I said, uh, was uh, Center Rule. Um, Center Rule has 20,000 plus housing units and households assigned to seven different neighborhoods from Z1 all the way to Z7 here. Um, I'm going to show you the results of this sequence model for all seven of them. But the, the biggest contrast you can see between these two. Just keep these two in mind in terms of location. The highest income, lowest density neighborhood, the mobile home park, which is considered as one of the most vulnerable types of housing. So what we did was that we ran 1,000 Monte Carlo simulations to assign randomly 
social vulnerability scores to each of the households in each of the neighborhoods. The biggest contrast, as you can see, is between Z1, Zone 1, and Zone 7. You have the highest accumulation of low social vulnerability scores here, highest accumulation of high social vulnerability scores here, right? Now, what did we get in the application? Time zero. Earthquake has just happened. Aggregate level, there is a pretty even distribution of folks being in emergency shelter, temporary shelter, temporary housing, permanent housing, right? And you can see the distribution of these are all housing units, the households, distribution across various neighborhoods. Now, one month passes, aggregate level, quite a lot of households, 8,000 plus, have moved to permanent housing. These are the insured folks who didn't have much damages. They had uh, good retrofits on their homes. They don't have much damages. They are back to their homes. But then look at the two contrasting neighborhoods where you can see differences in colors. Here, overarching shade is green. This is stage. Here, you see lots and lots of blue, right? They are still, so this is a sign. When I see this, I'm happy. The model is working. 12 months later, look at the predominant shades of green pretty much everywhere. Look at the variation that we have here in the highest social vulnerability score neighborhood, which the numbers are small, so it doesn't show here. But within this, this, this is the importance of looking at this aggregate measure. You can see the folks who are struggling to reach the permanent housing stage. Now, last thing we did here was that we went back to the literature, especially sociology literature, to find uh, qualitative evidence of narratives of households who have various sequences, which would help us picture better the results that we got from the mark of chain. Um, this would be, this household three would be a good example to look at. Time zero, this is where they are, stage number two. They didn't have to go to a female or a class shelter. Many people are scared to go to those shelters for many different reasons. Stuck for six months in the, in the temporary shelter, uh, emergency temporary shelter, sorry. Then um, six months, they jump into the temporary housing, have to stay there for more than six months. Close to 18 months, they reach the dream, permanent housing. And the cost of that, we don't know, do they extend their female vouchers to stay in the hotels. That was the case for so many Puerto Rico families who were just have to um, um, see and wait if FEMA would extend. And the extensions would have to come. You just be extremely stressed for that to happen. You see in household four, the case where um, back and forth, back and forth, then bouncing from one year after, bouncing from um, point zero emergency shelter um, all the way to becoming homeless. We don't have the emergency shelters for you anymore. Go to a homeless shelter. This happened to many of the Katrina diaspora, unfortunately. So let me show you the thing that I told you you don't need to worry about so much. The causal factors that came up, regardless of how I was measuring the outcome, regardless of what input variables I was putting in the models. Damage level is by far the most consistent one that slows down, pace up everything, no matter how you measure it. Second one is racial and ethnic minorities that have a slower pace, have lower chances of restoring their value. But please pay attention to that but. That doesn't mean they are also slower to occupy their houses. I knew this anecdotally, but this is good evidence quantitatively, that they do go back to not damaged homes, not repaired homes. Resources, of course, this was the first chance we had to measure at household level resources. Insurance payout, not having insurance policy, there's a difference. Getting a payout from your insurance was extremely significant uh, for the outcomes that you get. Income, it has mixed impacts, really importantly, Household income does not have linear impacts on the occupancy chance. Like I said, when I showed my, my longer term models, depending on income, people decide not to go back to a house, even if it's not damaged. And finally, rental occupied. 
I'm not surprised that that would come up consistently because the assistance policies, the regulations for evacuating versus having the permission to come back, the control they have over that is extremely different between renter households and owner households. I think I'm going to stop here. I hope in the Q&A, if somebody is interested in the policy lessons, we can get back to that. I will. Yeah, okay. Jackie. Jackie. So I was wondering about your stage five. Off the sequence model. Last model and whether that includes people just giving up and leaving. So I guess a lot of that happened after Katrina, and I'm wondering how that affects your ability to even do these studies. To be accurate, I do have the list of the assumptions we have, so I wouldn't use my memory. Oops. So what were the conditions? We would send that household to stage five. If it takes them longer than seven years to reach stage four, that's one condition. Or if they experience more than four regressive steps in 12 months. I mean, staying in um, emergency shelter, actually emergency shelters close by law, they have to close. In temporary housing for uh, more than four steps, over a 12 month period. Or if they have seven aggressive steps in, tw in 24 uh, time steps, which is, I mean, each step is one month, of course, two years, or 10 regressive steps. Now, we didn't explicitly consider if they leave, right? Um, I think I kind of remember our discussions about that when we were building this model. Main reason for that, I think it was because Applying this model to Im with empirical data it would be so hard to keep track of those folks and incorporate their data in here. So in a way, these one, two, three, four conditions are addressing that, not in the most like, kind of percent comprehensive way, uh, so but in a way that is quantifiable for this mathematical model. How much do you think that factor of people just like leaving Underestimate how bad the situation Underestimate is. Underestimate or overestimate? Well, you would, uh, if they just disappeared from your data. From that community. Yeah. Okay. Then you would miss them and the impact that the disaster really had on them. I, I was wondering how that would show up, if at all, in, in what you're trying to do. Given that these are housing units, these are households linked to a physical unit in that community, they would not show up. They would not show up. Yes. And that is, <laughs> you know, that, that is the next level modeling challenge. But thank you for presenting that challenge. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if, OK, first of all, great talk, especially yes. given the disaster of the tech. Oh, said, that was nothing. Uh, <laughs> happens all the time. Disaster recovery. Disaster recovery. <laughs> convincing case here about the, the link between socioeconomic status and um, uh, difficulty in recovery after disaster. And damage. And damage. Um, he, yeah. So have you or your group, do, do you guys work with policymakers to add a second layer of protection? Or are you still at the stage where you are um, just screaming in our own voice. Yeah. <laughs> so short answer is yes. That doesn't mean it's effective. So in the let's say in the past, especially because of the visibility of the sporting million dollar center, they pay more attention. <laughs> Not to me personally. But to you people. To NIST who is the funder, yeah. And people who are affiliated. So there is interest, they do listen, but I don't think that's enough. So what I do usually so, I mean, you know, as academics, we become part of these advocacy groups and everything yeah. as much as we can. 
one of the ones that I am the biggest fan of, we have the, here in DC of course, the National Low Income Housing Coalition. And they, uh, they have the whole separate, I mean, it's all about affordable housing, their mission. But part of it has to do with affordable housing after disasters. So one of the things that they were pushing for for years, I'm glad that you asked that question, Sharon. And FEMA did change, because it was coming up in study after study, including my, 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 my own. Especially in um, southern communities, black people, they own the property, but they don't have the same documentation that you and I have to show the D, to show this list, the, the old list that FEMA had, oh. to show proof of ownership to get the IHP. Right. Which is not the biggest part of money. The biggest part is from government, is the CDB GDR, right. um, which comes from hard, it's very slow, that's a different story. But one of the effective policy changes that did happen that increases access to post-disaster housing and public resources is that FEMA, of course, Biden became the president, so that's part of it, changed and expanded what they accept for proof of ownership, which means thousands and thousands of more households after disasters are going to get access to those few thousand bucks for repairing, especially for flood damages. This is going to be a big deal. So we are trying, but I think we need to do a lot, a lot more. And thankfully these days, NSF and everybody in their big proposals, they ask for show your community engagement, show your policy, yeah. potential policy efforts. So we can't just do you know, the standard paragraph. Yeah. So if you look at, or does anyone in your group or your you encourage your students at all to think about where the next disaster is going to occur, or the kind of um, impl you know implications of, of different kinds of disasters, because it, that could inform the communities ahead of time, so that um, you know they're not dealing with the aftermath of a disaster. So there are, you know, whole groups of people, hazard modelers, I'm, I'm, uh, Kevin is not here. You know, people like Kevin. Um, all of these climate-induced disaster modelers who are trying to be, what's the word, ahead of the game and try to predict. I mean, NOAA has all of these models to do that. And FEMA uses many of them. So in terms of hazard modeling, we are not in a very bad shape, but in terms of alerting local communities, and as an urban planner, I would say we're talking about municipalities. Mm -hmm. Many of them are extremely low resource, of course, counties and states. Alerting them that, them that every hurricane season, let's say Louisiana, you are going to get a whole bunch of your parishes and communities devastated by, by housing, uh, sorry, by hurricanes or inland flooding. Um, I, can, I think I can say pretty confidently that they know. I mean, of course, it's, it's not by day or location or anything like that, but in terms of the probability, they know. Now, the question is, do they have the political willingness to change their everyday development planning in a way that get people out of harm's way? Remember, the biggest, most common predicting factor for pace of recovery was damage, damage, damage. So if you reduce the damage, you're reducing a whole lot of your post-disaster problem. Now, whether or not they have a political willingness to do that, that's one question. Maybe the bigger question is, do they have the money to do that? They don't, unfortunately. Most of them don't. I mean, since, since I mean, this is, this is exaggeration maybe, but since uh, we got this new administration, there are tons of, I mean, parts of the infrastructure bill, for example, that has to go towards the hazard mitigation grant program yeah. that goes from FEMA to these communities to spend on whatever, buying out homes, elevating, which would reduce the, would reduce the post-disaster headache, housing recovery headache. It's like, it's like Malcolm with the, with the, yeah, uh, mediation. The, the gates. I mean, you know, the gates. I mean, one, you pay now, or you pay a hell of a lot more later. Seven times more. Yeah. That's calculated. Seven times more. Well, I think the U.S. is very bad at being proactive rather than reactive. Yeah, you know, we just pour billions up. after the fact. Yeah. Right. Just just because we think they can afford it. Cannot prepare for the 
disaster and only to rebuild in place. Such a long way of thinking. The yeah. same with the Army Corps of Engineers. Yeah. When they do their cost benefit analyses or whatever it is, they won't do it unless the benefits see the cost but the benefits are really restricted by regulation and it's all to do with rebuilding what they call discounted damaged infrastructure. And it's also very physical, their calculations. They do not take into account the environmental, ecological, social. I once asked the army, what, what's the value of human life? And being the army, they would not tell me. Especially, especially in the, if you're socially vulnerable. Who cares? I know. The other thing, I, I, I participated in a Suffolk County task force on post Sandy five years later, and we had town hall meetings all through the county. And at those meetings, what struck me was in the first three rows, there were all middle-aged women who had been dispossessed. And the first question that went to my head is, where is the men in their life? Where are the husbands, the partners, the boyfriends? They all ran for the hills. And they left these women, probably with young children, and not having the resources to rebuild their houses. And then the tax base of their community collapses because half the houses were wrecked. And it was terrible. And this was five years later. And Sandy was one of the best resourced post disaster recoveries in this really? nation. Because I thought it was terrible. Because really, it was one of the best resourced. These women were telling us that they tried to FEMA or the Small Business Administration was chaos, and those agencies couldn't cope. I'm sure I wouldn't be able to do those People forms. It would drive me crazy. There, they all left them because of the stress of thousands and thousands of people. The whole country is not geared for them. Yeah. Yeah, that's why it's 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 disaster recovery, especially housing disaster recovery, is the second disaster, which could be even more traumatizing than the hurricane itself, than the fire itself. I I I didn't. I had another study, totally separate. And uh, forgive me for a distraction, but the campfire in California. My focus was on housing. We have a pending proposal for housing, but our NSF funding was to look at schools and hospitals. Yeah. But housing comes up a lot. Yeah. Um, more than two years later, nobody has received any money. And of course, all of them are waiting for the lawsuit that they filed against PG&E. PG&E was the utility company that was the cause of the whole ignition. And the, so yeah. you, you can afford, you move to Oregon, you move somewhere else. You just the Army's trying. I mean, they are trying to the environmental effect. But in the city of Long Beach on South Shore Long Island, they come up with these crazy plans of lifting either 14,000 homes or 41,000 homes. How's that going to happen? If you can pay for it, why not? They won't do it. And it's going to be extremely unequitable, even if you can pay for it. So I, yeah, I assume it's probably going to kick off and uh, stop in five minutes. But anyway, thank you. This was. Thought-provoking, as usual. I hope it wasn't too upsetting. Well, oh, well, <laughs> as a taxpayer, and uh, yeah, right, this is the only upsetting. But <laughs> 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 you're talking. Thank you. This was great. Um,